Featuring Cambridge University's Dr Chris Smith, this is Ask the Naked Scientists. Five, six, seven, eight. Uh, welcome back. 22 minutes past nine. We welcome Dr. Chris Smith, the naked scientist via Zoom from London lecturer at the University of Cambridge with all the answers to all of your questions. Welcome, Chris. Great to have you back. Good morning. OK, I think we're going to go straight into it since we have limited time. Let's let's go to the voice notes. Joe, Joe's going to play us a couple there. Are you lining up still? Should I go to the others? Oh, there we go. Good morning, Dr. Chris. Maurice from Paris here. I'm um, sitting chilling on the beach the other day looking at the seagulls and I thought, the old guy, how far out of from the coast do you guys actually fly? Uh, I believe uh, uh, seagulls only fly to a certain distance. Um, do you perhaps know what the distance is? Okay. In a word, mm. in a word, no. Oh. <laughs> I don't know what the distance that the seagulls will fly offshore is. Some seabirds, of course, make huge journeys and albatrosses can be seen miles from miles from anywhere but seagulls i don't know the answer so if there are any budding ornithologists who can help us out with where seagulls regard as their home range and how far they will they will dare to tread or fly from the coast that would be useful to know okay thank you for that question let's go to another voice note good morning i have a question for dr chris smith please um my question is around temperature so my understanding of heat is that it is what we experience as heat is just the vibration of molecules. So molecules vibrating and knocking to each other a lot, that is what we experience as heat. And heat transference is the air molecules are vibrating, which vibrates the molecules of your skin, and that's how heat gets transferred. So how then does the sun transfer heat to the earth? Because I know there are molecules in space, but very, very few. So how does that and I know the sun's very hot, but I still don't quite get how the sun transfers to the earth. I look forward to the answer. Thank you. right Oh Well, when we sit down in our physics classes, we learn that there are three ways in which heat is transferred. Conduction, which exactly as you say, is where I have a particle, say it's in a blob of water or it's in a metal bar and the particle is vibrating and the more energy it has because it's hotter the harder it shakes around and it bashes into the particles next door and that makes them shake around which bashes into the particles next door and makes them shake around like a newton's cradle and that's how energy the vibration in the particles is transferred through the material the second one is convection Heat rises, so you can transfer heat from an area of lots of heat to lower amounts of heat because the heat will rise, because it changes the density of, say, the gas. So if we warm up some air, the particles are moving faster, they're shaking around harder, they're hotter, so they actually spend more time further apart, and if they spend more time further apart, they're less dense, and less dense things float on more dense things, so the hot air rises and the cold air sinks, so that's another way. The third and crucial way to answer your question is radiation. So when the sun is actually producing heat, yes, the material in the sun is shaking around and producing a lot of energy. On the surface, it's about 5,000 degrees. In the middle, it's millions of degrees. But between the sun and us is largely empty space. There are very few atoms there. So that you can't use conduction or convection to get the heat from the sun, but it's getting here. And that's because the sun is emitting light. The particles are so energised in the sun that they are spitting out photons, packets of light, and packets of light photons are electromagnetic radiation, radio waves, microwaves, X-rays, visible light, gamma rays. These are all kinds of electromagnetic radiation, and the sun puts out a broad swathe of, of some of these, and they don't need a medium to transfer through. They come through space because when you have an electromagnetic wave, you've got a changing electrical field... This electrical field then causes a changing magnetic field, and if you have a changing magnetic field, you get a changing electrical field. And so it propagates without any further assistance over vast distances. And then when it hits the Earth, it interacts with matter on the Earth, and because light has momentum, it will impart that energy to the thing it hits and make that thing move or vibrate, and hey presto, you have heat transfer. A medical question. Um, what is the status of malaria vaccine rollout in Africa? What countries have made it available? My three-year-old grandson is going to Ghana and his parents for two years. And what special precautions should one take? 
There are two vaccines which have been worked up for malaria protection and their aim is to try to bring down the death toll from malaria from about the three quarters of a million people who die every year, 70% of them children. The, they work by priming the immune system against a crucial part of the outer coat of the malaria parasite, which is a parasite transferred by or transmitted by mosquitoes that lives in red blood cells. And depending upon what type of malaria, there are four different common types of human malaria, it has a blood phase which can also involve a liver phase. And this stops that, the, that parasite getting between these different phases and completing its life cycle. So it can get into the body, but it can't grow if you've been vaccinated. And the, the vaccine results are really very good. So at the moment, the aim is to have two vaccines made by two rival groups, two companies, and to scale up the production. The problem is the demand is absolutely huge and the ability to keep up with vaccine supplies is at the moment quite limited. But they are on a scale-up mission and the aim is to ramp up production in Africa to very high levels very quickly so that as soon as possible people can begin to get this and this should help to have a major impact on the disease but it's going to have political issues, it's going to have geographical and access issues and therefore it's not a simple question of saying here's a vaccine now everyone can get it. Surprising really given that when Covid came along in record time we A had a vaccine and B got it to everyone pretty much who needed it within record time but for this one it seems to be taking a bit longer. Okay we got a bit of a preoccupation about about temperatures today. I think it's got something to do with the fact that we, we're going to have a, 20, a 36 degree day today. Um, one question in why does hot weather make your muscles more tired? That's from Marion in Sunningdale. Somebody else says, what's the maximum temperature a human can survive and for how long? Well, muscles first. Probably the reason you feel achy and more fatigued is because when you are very hot, the way the body controls heat, because we are homeothermic, we have to maintain a steady state body temperature to be healthy. We can't have ra radical departures of our body temperature over a big range because our enzymes don't work properly and therefore our metabolism wouldn't work properly and we wouldn't live very long. So the body has to invest considerable effort in holding our temperature over a set point, a very narrow range, which it can vary because when we get a fever, of course, you can elevate your body temperature a bit. And sometimes when you go out and about and get cold, your body temperature can drop a bit. It's still safe for it to do so because their mechanisms kick in to control it. But that's the key thing. Your body is controlling its temperature. And one of the ways it does that when you get very hot is it diverts a lot of your blood flow away from your core structures towards your superficial structures like skin, your fingers, your face, head, and it massively ramps up sweating. So not only are you diverting your blood flow away from things that you normally use a lot of blood flow to work, like muscles, you're also increasing the flow through skin, which can make you feel warm, hot and tired because you don't have as much blood going to your muscles. But also, if you increase your sweating rate, you're going to become more dehydrated. And in a really hot condition, a person can sweat five litres an hour, no problem. So you can deplete your total body water. And because wow. sweat is made from your plasma in your blood, it's also very salty. So you can also throw your electrolyte balance off as well, particularly if you're older, you don't have as good an ability to compensate with your cardiovascular system. So this can have a, a quite a debilitating effect and it, it does end up with people falling over because they have low blood pressure, they get hypotension and heat kills. And we see every year around the world where there are big heat waves in first places, you see a big blip in people who end up in hospital or worse. And Anthony's question about the top temperature we can survive, this will come down again to the individual because some people are going to be more resilient than other people in terms of having a better cardiovascular system, general overall fitness and health. That means they can adapt a bit more for a bit longer. But the bottom line is that we have to maintain a steady state body temperature centred on about 37 degrees C. If we allow our body temperature to go much above that, it starts to affect the way our enzymes work and our metabolism. And the reason for this is enzymes, which are proteins, which are biological catalysts in the body and make the chemical reactions that give us energy and keep us alive, the way they work is that they have a certain structure. And as the temperature goes up, the shape and structure of the enzyme starts to change. And after a fairly narrow range of temperatures, the enzyme stops working properly 
and ceases to function and this means that your cells start to go off kilter and biochemically they start to fail. So once you get much above temperatures into the 40s, you are into the danger zone and if you go much above low 40s for very long, 40, 45 degrees, your body temperature that is, you're not going to survive that for very long. So it's not really um, something that we can tolerate. We have not adapted to, to have those sorts of temperatures for very, very long because our body just can't take it. A question from Errol. How do vultures source their food? Is it by sight or smell? Uh, both. And we had a question the other day about whether birds can taste stuff. And... Um, the answer is birds definitely do have taste buds and they definitely can taste but they also have a fierce sense of smell they're very good at smelling things and their vision is excellent most birds have better color vision and more acute vision than we do so the way any bird finds its food is it uses vision and that gives it the long sight over where it might find something to eat it uses color vision to particularly pick out things that look like choice morsels and then when it gets closer, it has a closer look and then a smell and then possibly even a taste once it's decided, yep, that's my lunch. Um, another question in from Solly. Rewilding, um, where farmers leave land and don't grow anything, basically allowing nature to take over. Is it possible for the natural flora, maybe uh, the native plants to return, repopula repopulate a farm that's been left to its own devices? Not always. And the reason for this is that the ecosystem is a dense spider web of interconnections. Everything is connected to everything else. People often ask us on this program, why don't we just get rid of mosquitoes? Because they're a real pain and they're the most dangerous animal on earth. The problem is that everything is something else's lunch. And if you remove things from the ecosystem, that cobweb, it's a bit like chopping some of the strands it goes out of shape and when we come along and we change the environment and we remove certain species we bring in foreign species we change the characteristics of the environment and the soil and so on we are altering the shape of that network of connections that is the the natural ecosystem and because we have changed it we can't expect that it will immediately relapse and revert to what it used to be for instance, the services provided by elephants that would have roamed across that land and broken down the big trees, opened up the bush and the understory, allowed other things to come through, that won't be happening, at least initially. So you've got to take a long-term viewpoint and you've got to take a big-picture viewpoint. How do I put it back to how it was before we got anywhere near there and also reintroduce some of the species that we've excluded or even eradicated in certain geographies? So it's not as simple as just rele releasing our hold on a piece of land and expecting it to go straight back because we have in some cases made near indelible changes. Give long enough, it obviously would recover. But if we want that to happen uh, on a time frame that we can benefit from, we, ne we need to give nature some help. I think a question that all of us want to wanna, wanna ask of you uh, we have a colleague, John Maytham, he's a delightful treasure trove of knowledge uh, in the afternoon. Uh, the question is, how do you retain information so accurately, Dr. Smith? Well, um, I've now been doing The Naked Scientist, not just here. I mean, it's 15 years since we started uh, doing these programmes, almost 16 actually, in South Africa. But I started making science radio programmes in 1999 and my first programs I made myself from the year 2000. So we're almost a, a, a sort of quarter of a century of doing this. And over that time I've interviewed, I totted it up the other day, something like five or 6,000 scientists and researchers. And if you sat down with five or 6,000 of the world's brightest people for half an hour, you'd hopefully pick up a thing or two. And so they've they've taught me well, I would argue. So I'm lucky to be blessed with a good memory and an inquiring mind. And when you put that together with people willing to devote me some of their time and teach me some things, I've been able to learn and I've been very lucky to do so. And I'm very grateful to them for giving up their time to talk to me. I think the question is, are some people better wired to retain that information <laughs> than others? I think it's motivation, in my case, as much as anything. It's wanting to know. It's having that thirst for knowledge and that light bulb moment that you often talk about, Clarence. When you come across an answer to something and it chimes with something you'd always wondered about, it gives this big surge of the chemical dopamine in your brain, a pleasure chemical, which makes you feel very good about having learned that thing. 
And if you have a good feeling, you tend to remember a good feeling. And if there's a fact attached to it, you remember that too. So I think it's because I have this strong thirst for knowledge and understanding, and I love doing that. And then I get to share that knowledge with other people, and that reinforces it. That helps me to stay current and also to remember all these things. There's an implication here. You, you're suggesting that, that we're not stupid, that there isn't such a thing as stupidity. There's certainly a thing such as stupidity as we see all around the world every day. But usually, and in, certainly in the past, we've let, we've, we've, let, um, we've let nature take its course, haven't we? But um, unfortunately, we're getting in the way of Charles Darwin in the modern era. And that, unfortunately, is probably having deleterious effects on the common sense of mankind. OK, uh, we're going to have to wrap it there. Thank you very much, Dr. Chris Smith, the naked scientist.